Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Hamid Karagozlu, and I'm the U.S. representative of International Organization to Preserve Human Rights, uh, and also a member of Iran Action Group at IRF. Uh, many thanks to our distinguished panelists for participating in this webinar, as well as those who have joined in to view the program. Special thanks to Ms. Shirin Ebadi, the renowned human rights activist and legal scholar who has dedicated decades of her life fighting the injustices of this regime and representing uh, its victims both in Iran and abroad. Thank you for being here on such short notice. I also would like to thank my colleagues, Matthias Pertula, Manish Churchill, Mr. Sabatan in US, and Vahid Bejdi in UK for their instrumental role in making this event happen. Um, as you already know, the subject of the, uh, today's webinar is the recent disturbing developments in Iran um, and their effect on religious minorities, uh, prisoners of conscience, dissidents, activists, and frankly, on all Iranians. And the primary issues of concern are, one, the recent rise in violence and oppression of religious minorities and prisoners of conscience. Two, the two, two new laws uh, introduced by the parliament, articles 499 and 500, to be added to volume five of the Islamic Penal Code, which enables the regime to brand any entity or group as a sect, a crime punishable by law, which can be escalated to include death penalty. Uh, then it's the structural changes that Mr. Khamenei has made to his regime, taking over all three branches of the government by ultra hardline IRGC members. And finally, the uh, threats made by Khamenei and IRGC against US Jews um, in general and Israel hinting at their plans for a possible regional war. Um, and uh, I would like to explore what it means uh, for the oppressed people of Iran and uh, the region as a whole. And because of the limited time we have, I ask that each panelist speak for five to seven minutes discussing these issues, as well as uh, other challenges their respective communities in Iran face today and what is in store for them. Then we move to the QA session. We start with Ms. Abadi, then we'll move to Mr. Uh, Sabatan of Bahai International Community, followed by Mr. Mansour Borji of Article 18 on behalf, to, uh, behalf of the Christian communities in Iran. Then Ms. Sharon Nazarian of ADL to discuss the issues and challenges the Jewish community in Iran faces today um, and the threat to Jews all over the world. And last but not least, my dear friend, Mr. Ibrahim Ahrari, um, on behalf of the Sunni community, a large and complex community of at least 20 million Iranians uh, with many different ethnicities and backgrounds. Uh, Ms. Mina Faris is also here to act as interpreter for uh, uh, Ms. Ebadi and Mr. Ahredi who present in Farsi. And with that, I ask Ms. Ebadi to begin. Thank you. I would like to uh, greet uh, everybody who is present here and also all those uh, who um, can hear uh, my uh, statements. Uh, I just uh, would like to tell you one thing, and that is the following. Uh, I, our problem uh, is not that hardliners are in power or have come to power. Uh, even if the others were in power, it would not make any difference. The reason is the political structure in the country and also our constitution, because our constitution is based on discrimination and uh, our uh, official uh, religion is Shia Islam and uh, only Christians, uh, uh, Zoroastrians, and the Jews are recognized as, uh, as, uh, um, uh, uh, as religions in Iran, and uh, nobody else is recognized. Uh, for example, Baha'is are not recognized. Yazidis are, um, are not recognized. None, no other religion is recognized except these. They have no rights. and. Uh, and the, the, the most oppressed are the Baha'is in Iran. Not only uh, um, they suffer when they are alive and they do not have any rights uh, in uh, inter alia, uh, right to education, but also even after they die, they have no rights because they are not allowed to be uh, buried in uh, the city where they die. They are not 
allowed to be buried in the cemetery of that city. There are only a few limited places where they can be buried. And not only uh, Baha'is and those uh, uh, whose religion is not officially recognized are discriminated against and are oppressed, but also even those whose religion is recognized officially, they are also discriminated against political discrimination and all these discrimination, uh, discriminations are imposed upon the law, uh, the law. I would like to give you an example. For example, uh, imagine that there is an Iranian uh, and that he or she is a Jew and uh, dies, passes on, and it's very natural that uh, his assets, properties are divided among his children. Um, if he has three you know, sons, according to the Jewish law, the uh, property has to be distributed among these three. However, if one of his relatives, for example, uh, a nephew, uh, had con has converted to uh, Islam, this person will have the right to disherit all the, uh, all the sons of this deceased person. Why? Because the law says that the person who has converted to Islam is going to uh, proceed over anybody else, even the children of that person. So we have a lot of problems similar to this in our laws. I do not have the time to name all of them. But you should not think, and you should not think that uh, only non-Muslims are oppressed. The Sunnis are also oppressed very much. Uh, for example, uh, they uh, cannot even uh, build a mosque in Tehran. And what is even worse, you should not imagine that uh, oppression is only limited to these uh, people. No, I have to remind you of the fact that anybody who has a different way of thinking, whose way of thinking is not the same as that of the government, is going to be encountered with torture and prison. For example, the dervishes, Gonobadi dervishes, they, these were Shiites and the, they are non-political completely uh, because uh, Sufis, uh, they are not political people, they are not after political power, but we saw uh, what happened to them. And right now, also, a lot of them uh, have, are in prison, they are languishing in prison uh, for a long time. And therefore, our problem is not whether to um, have moderates in power or hardliners in power, no. Our problem is a structural problem. It's a problem which uh, uh, exists in our constitution. And therefore, if we want uh, to improve the situation, the constitution has to be updated and changed. We have to have a constitution in which religion is separated from power, from politics, in which people could have the right to have any kind of religion they want. That's to say a secular democratic regime. That's what Iran needs so that he get, it can come out of this situation. And our uh, problem uh, uh, also is not to have one leader or this kind of a parliament or not. Our problem is deeper than that. If we want to resolve the problem, we have to change the constitution. And if we do not do that, there will be no other solution. There is no other solution but to change the constitution and to change Iran into a secular democratic state. Thank you, Ms. Abadi, for your uh, insightful analysis. Uh, next, we are moving to uh, Farhad Sabatan from uh, International Bahai Community. Go ahead, please. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Abadi, for your enlightening remarks on this very crucial issue. 
it's uh, truly heartwarming to have the support of experts such as yourself that can present a very clear and concise analysis of the situation that we are all facing in Iran. Uh, I'd like to also extend my deepest appreciation to the IRF Roundtable for organizing this important forum and my colleagues representing our brothers and sisters in Iran who are the target of systematic persecution solely because of their beliefs. Today, I'll be sharing with you a brief summary of the current situation of the Baha'is in Iran. But before I get to that, I want to acknowledge that my concern is definitely not limited to the case of Baha'is because the right to freedom of belief and religion is universal and everyone's right to adopt and exercise a religion or belief must be protected and respected. The persecution of the Baha'is has persisted over the last 40 years and has increasingly intensified in various forms. One important reason for this prolonged repression is that the Baha'i faith is not recognized in Iran as an independent religion, even though it is established in virtually every country of the world, has been registered with the United Nations as a non-governmental organization since 1948, and has currently consultative status with the United Nations Economic and Social Council and other agencies. As Mrs. Abadi said, the Iranian constitution considers only Judaism, Christianity, and Zoroastrianism as recognized religions in Iran, while Baha'is are considered as unprotected infidels and apostates. As such, the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran has become systematic, methodic, pre-planned, intentional, unabated, and with the full knowledge of the highest authorities in Iran. With deep regret, it continues to this day with undiminished severity. Baha'is have been and are deprived of the right to life, the right to freedom of belief, the right from arbitrary arrest and detention, the right to freedom from torture and abuse, the right to representation, the right to employment, the right to own or operate a business, the right to higher education, the right to receive pensions, the right to bury their debt, the right to enjoy protection of their holy sites in Iran, the right to enjoy protection of their cemeteries, the right to protection from individual attacks, the right to hold assembly, the right to have free and fair election of their institutions, the right to freedom of speech and expression, and many, many other rights that will exhaust my time if I were to go through the whole thing. More than 200 Baha'is have been executed since the beginning of the Islamic revolution in Iran. Hundreds of others have been arbitrarily imprisoned, abused, and tortured. Thousands have lost their properties, denied access to higher education, deprived of their pensions, and faced many other forms of persecution. Not only is the Iranian government at the highest level fully aware of the persecution of the Baha'is in Iran, but it has officially sanctioned it. The policy was started in a 1991 confidential memorandum of the Supreme Revolutionary Cultural Council, which was discovered in 1993 by Galindo Paul, the United Nations Special Rapporteur for Iran. In this memo, Ujjatul Islam Sayyid Muhammad Gul Paigani addressed the Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei uh, and Ayatollah Hashemi Rafsanjani considering the Baha'i question. The memorandum shows a blueprint for the strangulation of the Iranian Baha'i community in which it is stated that, quote, the government's dealings with them, meaning Baha'is, must be in such a way that their progress and development are blocked. This policy, unfortunately, has continued to this day in various forms. Today, we, the Baha'i International Community, are extremely concerned about a new wave of arbitrary arrests, interrogations, detention of young and old Baha'is on false and fabricated charges and baseless accusations, sentences handed down without a shred of credible evidence, violating every procedural rule of adjudication, all leading to unreasonable and long imprisonment. Literally thousands of official Iranian uh, court documents have been collected and are made publicly available by Baha'i International Community, clearly showing these violations. These documents can be found in a bilingual website, Archives of Baha'i Persecution in Iran, Khaneya Asnad Baha'i Setizida Iran. The most recent wave of persecution points to targeting at least 75 Baha'is across the country, including reports of a new threat to uproot the community in Shiraz, 
along with an unprecedented number of new prison sentences, reincarcerations, and a media campaign of hatred against the Baha'is. In recent weeks, 40 Baha'is in Shiraz, whose cases were pending for months, have been summoned to court, representing an unprecedented number of court summons against Baha'is in a single city in recent years. In addition to Shiraz, Baha'is is in Birjan, Yazd, Karaj, Qa'im Shah, Kerman Shah, and Isfahan have been arrested, summoned to court, tried, sentenced, or imprisoned solely for their beliefs. After being arrested and released on high bail, these individuals have faced months and sometimes years of waiting between their arrest, trial, uh, and appeal court, and the beginning of their jail terms, adding an additional psychological burden. Being summoned to prison adds an additional risk of exposure to the novel coronavirus, exacerbating an already horrible prospect for the Baha'is, as well as other religious minorities and prisoners of conscience. To conclude, make no mistake, despite the claims made by Iranian officials that Baha'is are not being persecuted for their religion, ample official Iranian documents clearly demonstrate the contrary. In many of these documents, Individual Baha'is are referred to as members of the misguided Baha'i sect, a derogatory term used to refer to the Baha'i faith in Iran, whose crime would be forgiven if they recant their faith. This situation cannot and must not be allowed to continue. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Salvatan. Um, next, we move to uh, Mr. Borji from Article 18. Please go ahead. Grateful for the opportunity and uh, the IRF to um, make this uh, panel available to um, update ourselves about the very uh, important concern and this fundamental right that uh, affects um, every other area of life, the right to religious freedom. Um, as I was listening to uh, the previous uh, reports about the situation of the human rights, uh, religious freedom in Iran and also the situation of Baha'is, um, I think it's important to uh, mention that the Christians are one of the three recognized religious minorities in Iran. Um, they continue to face multiple violations of their uh, uh, freedom of religion and beliefs. Um, all but a handful of churches that uh, once offered services in uh, the national language of Farsi uh, or Persian have now been forced to close since the Islamic Revolution, uh, while the remaining um, churches um, are tightly monitored to ensure that uh, no, no uh, Muslim-born uh, Iranians attend them. Um, so this applies not only to recognize ethnic Armenian and Assyrian congregation, but also who are basically the show churches of the Iranian government to the international com uh, community to uh, portray themselves as tolerant of religious freedom, but also uh, the remaining visible churches um, who are tolerated have little freedom as uh, they have been, this has been shown uh, by the imprisonment in recent years of uh, the Armenian church member Sevada Vassar, uh, who is from the Orthodox Church, or for instance, the prison sentences given to Assyrian pastor Victor Betambraz and his wife Shamiram Isavi, who collectively um, facing a 15 year prison sentence um, for interacting with converts from Muslim background. Uh, and of course, for, the, uh, for those converts who face the greatest challenge to their fundamental freedom, uh, but no visible churches is able to accept them, meaning that they have no other options uh, but to practice their faith in secret. And um, if they want to meet together with other Christians to pray or to worship, uh, the only option available for them is to um, attend secret networks of underground house churches that have sprang up uh, in the wake of the closure of the Persian uh, speaking uh, churches and services. So it's not only um, a violation of their rights to religious freedom, but also um, um, it comes at a very great uh, personal risk to them as uh, if uh, they're attending these house churches and are often raided uh, and members are arrested and forced to sign commitments to have no further interaction with Christians. That's the least they can get. And they could be very hopeful if they are let go, if they are let go 
by just one signing one commitment, but failure to abide by these restricting and suffocating policies uh, practiced by the Islamic Republic of Iran. Um, they usually, uh, th this usually leads to charges of acting against national security, which can lead uh, in, in turn to prison sentences up to 15 years, as we have a number of cases documented and are available on our website, article18.com. Um, so such security-related charges have become uh, more common in the past decade, uh, replacing the religious-sounding uh, charges of apostasy. Uh, since this speech given by uh, the Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei, who listed house churches among the critical threats facing the Islamic Republic, if you remember, in October of 2010. Um, so this give, uh, gave the security forces, including SEPA, um, to, uh, um, as a green light to harass and arrest thousands of house church members and they haven't held back and this continues as we speak. Uh, just over the weekend we had uh, a couple of arrests uh, which are uh, new and not even reported. Uh, hundreds have since spent time in prison, many have more have fled the country, mostly ending uh, uh, up in Turkey where um, they um, now face an uncertain future with no health insurance provisions or little hope for resettlement in a host country. Um, so there are recently, as we speak um, currently, about 16 Iranian Christians in prison. These are confirmed public cases. There are a number of others that are not made public because of uh, security concerns they've had or their families have had. Um, they're in prison simply because uh, they're a member of a house church. Um, uh, so the impact of this curtailment on Christians' religious freedom does go beyond their uh, practice of their faith, really. It also impacts upon their day-to-day -day life. Numerous discriminations against Christians and other religious minorities are embedded in the Islamic Republic's very core. That's uh, what the Honorable Ms. Shirin Abadi uh, just reflected upon. So Christians... Um, especially converts, uh, even, uh, and even those who are from the recognized Armenian and Syrian groups face discriminations in areas of employment, education, marriage, and also inheritance. Uh, let me just highlight one case. Yusuf Nadarhani uh, was well known around the world uh, for his uh, the case, court case that he went through for apostasy in 2010. Uh, simply because uh, he objected um, uh, to the forced education, uh, for is forced Islamic education of his children who were uh, Christian born. He himself was a convert, but uh, appealing to the Article 18 of Inter um, International Covenant on Civil and Pol Political Rights, he uh, held the right to uh, educate, uh, religious education for children of the parents, and because of that, he himself faced apostasy charges and death penalty, which after international outcry was overturned. We have so many similar cases that are now um, in prison. Yusuf himself in a second uh, court case uh, that opened up in 2016 is now spending second year of his 10 year prison sentence in Evan. So a uh, non-Muslim, uh, face uh, uh, non-Muslims face many limitations and unfair discrimination in their practice uh, in their private uh, and public life in Iran but these a small uh, number of cases that are highlighted publicly shows that uh, Iranian government considers a growing uh, circle of uh, Christians in Iran as unrecognized contrary to the public opinion that Christians are one of the three recognized religions in, in Iran. Iranian government usually showcases the ones that uh, affirm the uh, government uh, propaganda. So I'm grateful for your attention and open to any questions that may follow. Thank you, Mr. Borji. Now we move to uh, Ms. Nazarian. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. It's indeed a pleasure to be with you all today. And I also want to thank IRF for putting together this very distinguished panel and for including ADL in it. The ADL Anti-Defamation League, for those of you not familiar, is a 107-year-old um, civil rights Jewish organization that has fought for the defamation, against defamation of Jewish people 
as well as fought to secure just and fair treatment for all, all vulnerable groups. So I'd like to share my screen with you, um, if possible, to share with you some of my findings and my team's findings in terms of how the regime has um, messaged out its positioning regarding Jews generally. So um, ADL views the Iranian government's conduct as threatening in many different regards, including its sponsorship of terrorism, subversion, military, military aggression throughout the region, as well as its nuclear ambitions. But the regime's egregious human rights abuses, including scapegoating of minorities and its incitement of anti-Semitism worldwide, are both major concerns for us as well. Indeed, we agree with Secretary Pompeo's message in addition to the fact that Iran is the world's number one state sponsor of terror, Iran is also the world's largest state sponsor of anti-Semitism anywhere in the world today. Uh, many of you may be, should be familiar with this atrocious flyer that Iran's Supreme Leader released in English, Arabic, and Persian for May of 2020, showing terrorist groups overrunning Jerusalem and using the Nazi slogan of the final solution. During the COVID pandemic, um, the rhetoric coming from the Islamic Republic has really been heightened. And we have seen that all, um, all uh, leadership of the Islamic Republic have used this opportunity to once again scapegoat and um, target religious minorities, including Jews, as being behind the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Excuse me. Um, Khamenei's own um, TV stations and others have used language that have blamed Jews for using sorcery um, and using fantastical language like genies um, to um, use espionage and blaming Jews and other religious minorities for the expansion and, and spread of the virus. Um, the Iranian state, state TV has also done so and has uh, directly blamed the US and Israel for developing bioweapons um, that is behind the pandemic. Um, at the same time, uh, Iran's health ministry was sponsoring a cartoon contest on the global health pandemic. And uh, they partner with the same fantastical artists of groups who in the past had um, come up with cartoons regarding Holocaust denial. In this, uh, this cartoon, there are some examples you're seeing. The Iranian government um, really showed how they view this pandemic as being caused by Jews, by Israel, and other parties. Unfortunately, the uh, expansion of this uh, Rhetoric by the Islamic Republic um, is not only um, focused in Farsi and in English, but it is exported. And we see that through um, Press TV um, and Hispan TV, the rhetoric is truly globalized. I just want to take a few moments to share with you um, the expansion of this uh, horrendous rhetoric um, to Latin America. Um, I believe you're most, many of you are familiar um, with Iran's hand in the uh, two bombings that took place in Argentina in 1992 and 1994 via Hezbollah um, um, uh, operatives. We know that um, Iran's fingerprints are all over Latin America and the triple frontier and other regions. Um, Today, Iran's coziness with Venezuela um, um, really is, is nefarious. Um, in the triple frontier of Paraguay, Argentina, and Brazil, we see that uh, money laundering and narco activity is a source of funding for Hezbollah to expand its terrorism toward Israel and worldwide. Um, recent declarations of Hezbollah um, as a terrorist organization by Argentina points to the fact that the regimes in Latin America are very, very aware of the long fingerprints of uh, the Islamic Republic in their region. 
um, Hispan TV has really become a very powerful propaganda machine in Latin America. Um, it's a channel that really aims at bombarding Spanish-speaking audiences with conspiracies attacking Israel and the U.S. And only in the months of March and April of 2020, as the spread of COVID-19 global lockdown emerged, Hispan TV has issued more than 50 articles on Israel. Um, while not all articles are conspiratorial, they evidence that they, there is an obsession in Iran with singling out Israel and Jews as being the perpetrators of this um, of this disease. I do want to point out before I stop that my team is putting together right now a very in-depth analysis of Iranian state textbooks um, that should be released um, within a month or two, really delineating and specifically um, sharing and translating language in Iranian textbooks, um, targeting Jews, Baha'is, and other minorities um, using hate language and inciting uh, violence against them. Um, today, what I can share with you that the, um, what we've seen in the last few months is a concerted um, effort by the regime through um, violence, through vi fires that have taken place both at the tomb of Esther and Mordechai, at churches, in cemeteries. So there seems to be a, a real concerted effort by the regime to um, uh, bring attention and to detract from its own current um, pressures that it's under by attacking religious sites. And uh, so we are very careful about what kind of information we that ADL put out um, internationally. But we can see just through the rhetoric, the heightened rhetoric of this regime, that there is here a, a pivot um, to distract from the internal economic pressures that the regime is facing um, by attacking religious minorities, obviously, including the Jewish community, the Baha'i community, and the uh, Christian converts. So with that, I'll stop, and I'm happy to address, address any questions if they come. Thank you, Ms. Nazarian. And then uh, we move to uh, Mr. Ahradi. Go ahead, please. In the name of God, the merciful, the compassionate, Uh, Sadi, uh, the Iranian poet, uh, says that we human beings are all members of the same body and uh, we have been all created from the same substance. And if uh, one limb, one member is going to be pained, it will be impossible for the other limbs of the body to remain calm. Uh, my name is Ibrahim Ahrari, and I am representing uh, the Sunni community of Iran. And at initio, I would like to thank everybody who is present in this uh, event, uh, especially Mr. Gara Gozlu. He represents the community of the dervishes in Iran, who has provided this opportunity for us. And also, uh, Dr. Shirin Ebadi, uh, I would like to, uh, to thank her my, uh, especially. And also, I would like to thank Mrs. Farsi, he calls me, uh, for the interpretation. As uh, you are all aware, from the beginning of the revolution in Iran, which happened in the year 1979, there have been lots of policies for creating divisions. And all the religions and the sects and thinkers who were not confirmed by the regime were oppressed severely and were also discriminated against. An obvious example of that from the very the first days of the revolution was with regard to the followers of the faith of the Baha'is. Uh, they were deprived of university education, employment, uh, the uh, properties were confiscated and also they were murdered. 
Uh, however, uh, the members of the Sunni community, which is one of the biggest uh, uh, religious minorities in Iran, uh, and uh, it has a, a number of 20 million followers, were not uh, safe from these oppressions and uh, the discriminations rendered by the government. The provinces of Sistan and Baluchistan, uh, Kurdistan, uh, Kemasha, Azerbaijan, the West Western Azerbaijan, Gulistan, Ormozgan, and Boucher, uh, which are mainly populated by Sunnis, and also bigger sections of uh, Gilan, Khorasan. Uh, Eastern Azerbaijan, Kerman, and Fars. And uh, the majority of the Arab populations in Khuzestan are Sunnis. On the basis uh, of the statistics which have been published by the uh, government themselves, Uh, the Sunni population of Tehran is more than 1 million people and also in the other big cities. I would like to note the fact that in order not to know what the actual population of the Sunnis is, the registration of any kind of democratic demographic populations or statistics has been eliminated from the budget. Even the statistics that existed before the revolution have either been destroyed or have been taken out of circulation. In the Iranian constitution, the Sunnis can never become a leader, can never become a president or to occupy any of the high-ranking positions in the army. In Tehran, which is the capital of Iran, which has a population of Sunnis, more than one million people, this population is deprived of many of the rights. In Mashhad, on the 11th of Bahman of 1379, Uh, the, the biggest uh, mosque, which was a Sunni mosque, which was a long-standing mosque, was destroyed in one night. And precisely the next day, which was 12th of Bahman, 1375, these are all in the Persian calendar, I saw with my own eyes uh, that there were people who were saying their prayers in the Makki mosque in Zahidan, And uh, during the noon prayer, they were assailed by hundreds of uh, revolutionary guards who were armed. Uh, they were shot at, they were blooded, and they fell to the ground. There were many people who were killed, the hundreds were arrested, and hundreds more were arrested and were taken to places of torture. Uh, precisely from the very onset of the revolution, the thinkers, uh, the, the Sunni thinkers and the leaders were uh, uh, murdered either in, inside Iran or outside Iran, they were tortured, they were executed, assassinated and exiled. In a manner that in every province that you can imagine, the prayer leaders have been killed. Hundreds of Sunni youths from different provinces in Iran, such as Kurdistan, Khuzestan, Baluchistan, Khurasan, and other provinces have been receiving false charges due to their belief. 
which ha have led to security related charges in the worst of conditions and they have been imprisoned tortured and executed it is necessary to remind you of the fact that in some uh, nights uh, uh, many uh, youths the Sunni youths who were arabs or otherwise were all taken together and they were executed together. Also, those who have converted to Sunnism, to Sunni uh, belief, uh, are executed because of apostasy. Dr. Muzaffarian is uh, one example who was a very well known sergeant in Shiraz. economic, ed educational, and health-related deprivations, and also political deprivations, are crying out in provinces where they are populated by Sunnis. And uh, this very conveniently provides uh, the uh, difference in classes between these provinces and other provinces. Uh, not one day uh, passes that you do not to see any of the border carriers, the Kurdish border carriers, uh, being uh, killed. Uh, what is really troubling is uh, the uh, the humanitarian slogans which are given by the regime. Despite uh, all this oppression and uh, repeated violations of the human rights of the people, they still uh, claim uh, justice, uh, freedom of uh, minorities, and also defense of human rights. The, uh, the uh, media and those who are related uh, to the system, to the regime, do it all over the world. In conclusion, what I hope is that I see a future for my country in which freedom, equality in all the dimensions of life, democracy, and adhering to the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, coexistence of all thinkers and religious uh, um, um, religions will be foreseen. I greet you once again. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Ahredi. Um, following uh, uh, to his uh, points, uh, the false claim that the vast majority of Iran and Iranian population is Shia needs to be confronted. With over 20 million Sunnis and uh, 8 to 10 million Gonobadi Sufis that are not considered Muslim, you're talking about 40% of the population. So uh, that's a very important point that needs to be uh, taken into consideration. Then you have Jews, Mandovis, Izadis, Christians, Baha'is, um, um, although their population has diminished drastically since the revolution, but uh, uh, the majority is with the uh, non-Shia group, uh, and that's something that needs to be considered. Um, thank you very much. I'm going to move on to Q&A sessions. Uh, the question is posed to Ms. Abadi by Mehdad Nurani from UK. Uh, he says the Iranian regime, by the direct order of Ali Khamenei and Qasem Soleimani, shot and killed over 1,500 protesters who stood up against the tripling of the oil prices not long ago. Today, not a single explanation has been provided by the regime on this genocide. On the other hand, we see that many officials in the regime continue to talk about the recent unfortunate events in the U.S. as a pretext to uh, attack the U.S. administration and U.S. policies. Can you explain this hypocrisy? Yes, of course. 
while uh, Mr. Khamenei criticizes uh, the conduct of the uh, police in the United States, he says that uh, they kill people and uh, of course they take the upper hand. Whereas we must not forget that in the month of Auburn, uh, uh, in the year 1340, all of a sudden uh, they raised the price of uh, gasoline three times, therefore people ran to the streets. It was very peaceful, the demonstrations are very peaceful, but they uh, encountered bullets and therefore 1,500 people were killed. And the government, of course, does not accept this number and the government says that it was, the number was less than this, but up to now, uh, they have not given us the correct number. But what is more important than anything else is that when you shoot bullets, they shot bullets into the heads and the chests of people. And uh, therefore, uh, and also there were a number of uh, university students and uh, high school students that's to say that there were children who were going to school and on their way to school were shot and, and died. And none, there's no justification for what they have done. And if the uh, police in the United States are doing things wrong and is at fault, uh, this is no justification for the barbarity of the Iranian regime. And uh, it, we should not compare these two uh, regimes with each other. Of course, uh, uh, there are uh, people who say, uh, look, um, uh, American people are so sensitive towards the, uh, the administration of justice that if one person is killed, the whole country rises up to protest. And why is it that in Iran, people do not do the same? And in response, I have to say that uh, there is not any difference between our population and the people of the United States. The difference lies in our governments. That's to say that uh, the, in the whole of the United States, uh, people can um, go to the streets, uh, even in some places, uh, they uh, broke all the glass, uh, there was violence, but there was only one instance, uh, that's to say in Atlanta, uh, where, uh, the, uh, where police uh, killed one individual. Of course, it's not justifiable, it's something wrong to do. But in Iran, people uh, ha did not break any glass, they did not object, they did not say anything, anything. In a very peaceful, conciliatory manner, they came to the streets to demonstrate, and they uh, were confronted with that violence. And therefore, it's not the people who are at fault, it is the government uh, that uh, through extreme uh, violence oppresses people. And I have to remind you of the fact that violence is, uh, is not only now that we see it from the very uh, onset and establishment of the revolution, it was the same. Uh, that's to say, this is a government that believes that it only has to frighten um, the people, intimidate them, and through intimidation of the population, rule. And this is a situation that is getting worse and worse, that's to say every day the distance between, the divide between the people and the government becomes wider, and this is the same Islamic um, the, uh, the government that when it was established in 1979, it had the support of the majority of the people. The majority of the people voted for it. But now I can most certainly tell you that if there is a, a referendum um, now, more than 80% of the people would like this, this regime to change. Why? Because there's the violation, because of the same violation. and. If uh, they still have some supporters, 
those are the ones who are related uh, to the political power and those are the ones who are beholden to the government and have gained exorbitant wealth because of this government and therefore a number of people still support them but the majority of the people do not want this regime anymore in any way. Thank you, Mr. Abadi. Um, we're going to move on to the second question. Um, uh, it's posed by uh, Bahid Beheshti to Ms. Nazarian. His question is, human rights activists have been reporting cases of human rights violations in Iran for many years now. This issue is very clear for the entire world. It is now getting to a point where Khamenei openly says he wants to carry out the final solution to eliminate the Jewish people. My question is, have we not come to a realization globally that deporting cases of human rights violations in Iran is no longer enough? What can and should be done to confront this threat? Um, I agree. I agree that this uh, moment in time, we as a global community have to recognize that the Islamic Republic of Iran will not change itself and will not give in to uh, pressures unless its own existence is, is questioned and it's, it's threatened. We can see that um, the dynamic in the Middle East um, in itself, the changing uh, geostrategic environment, um, the pressure campaign by the Trump administration and other factors do impede uh, the behavior of this regime. So when the flyer that I shared with you was released by, um, the, by the regime and used the word final solution in it, um, in a very unprecedented uh, manner, um, uh, Ayatollah Khamenei came back the next day and clarified that that reference was not to the Jewish people, but to the state of Israel. So that pressure in itself speaks to the fact that the regime is sensitive to international criticism. Um, we know that the European Union, um, South Korea, and other trading partners of the regime have to also be brought in to bear pressure and to hold up um, the standards that we all embrace as uh, human rights um, standards. And so we at ADL, very much as part of our advocacy, is reaching out to Europeans, to Asians, uh, governments, and diplomatic corps to constantly remind them that the pressure that they have to bear has to go beyond just um, uh, issues of human rights, but to use their economic leverage to bear pressure on the regime. Uh, we can see that, you know, I, I saw one of the other questions that were in the chat was about, is this really an issue of Iran criticizing the Israeli government and not anti-Semitism? And there is ample evidence um, that this regime has held conferences that were focused on denial of the Holocaust, questioning the historical uh, validity of the Holocaust. As I showed in my presentation, all the rhetoric around the COVID-19, around Jews being experts in sorcery, um, and also the textbooks uh, that our analysis is showing, there's clear language that vilifies um, uh, religious minorities. Um, and so this is not an issue of one regime against another government. This is not about Iran versus Israel. This is about this regime continually uh, partaking in the scapegoating of its religious minorities. And, and therefore, we as a global community have to acknowledge that and have to bear pressure, whatever leverage points we have. And I think economics is probably the number one that we all have to really continue to advocate for, to bring pressure to this government to, to, um, for it to fall. Thank you. Thank you very much. The next question is for uh, Mr. Sabatan. Um, says, we know that one of the successes of the uh, IRI is the lobbies and contacts they have within established media sources. It's clear that many media sources frame their stories in such a manner to please the Iranian regime. Many of these media sources have been put in place in various countries by the Iranian regime to ensure positive coverage, coverage despite their continued violation of human rights. What can we do to resolve this issue and what uh, can we do to make the, uh, the, the media uh, accountable? 
Thank you. Uh, well, the media is, of course, sort of a mirror of the world, and they have a social responsibility to report facts and the truth. Now, uh, if they shirk that responsibility, if they avoid that responsibility, then there are those who actually sponsor them. They must be able to verify the facts and ensure that what is being said is essentially a reflection of factual statements. We know that, as Mrs. Nazirian very aptly mentioned, there is also a significant, huge campaign of misinformation by the Iranian government. Since January of this year alone, until now, more than 3,000 items in websites, radio programs, television programs have been uh, broadcast to vilify the Baha'is and spread misinformation. So aside from the funders of various uh, media that are reporting these things, I think we as citizens have a significant and grave responsibility to not support such media that do not uh, report facts. And in fact, they are giving misinformation. So I think that the, the, the way that can be, uh, they can be made accountable is really up to us, up to their supporter, and most importantly, really uh, observing their own social responsibility. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, the next question is by Mr. Robert Duncan, um, and he's asking, I'm sorry, this is late uh, submission of a question. I hope that uh, it will be addressed as a matter of course during the uh, discussions, but it would be very helpful to know if recent developments in Iran affect or should affect how freedom of religion or belief can be uh, promoted through the efforts of international advocates. Um, well, um, I'd like to briefly address this question. Uh, the uh, regime in Iran over the past 40 years has established thousands of centers all over the world, mosques, uh, places of uh, indoctrination, uh, all across uh, South America, Europe, uh, uh, Africa, and even in US. But to date, I mean, they have mosques, they have uh, <laughs> sermons. To date, there is not a single uh, uh, temple uh, for Buddhists in Iran. Sunnis cannot have uh, uh, built a new mosque in Tehran. Uh, the places of worship for Gonabadi Sufis uh, all across Iran have been shut down. Um, the same is true of Baha'is, the same is true of uh, converts to Christianity, even traditional Christian communities in Iran. So the, the uh, problem is the double standard that the Western communities, Western countries have. They allow uh, Islamic Republic to open these centers in their countries in return for favors, economic concessions, uh, all sorts of concessions, and uh, they turn a blind eye to what's happening in Iran. Uh, this is an issue that uh, the international community as a whole should address, should stand together, and uh, U.S. alone is not enough. Uh, it has been very effective, but uh, Europe has to join in. Uh, there's no hope for China and, and Russia, but uh, Europe has to join the U.S. and the rest of democracies around the world. Um, uh, for example, even China, uh, because of these close ties that the uh, Islamic Republic has established with them, uh, has allowed them to open mosques and centers in China. At the same time that they have 1.8 million Uyghurs in prison and 20 million Muslims oppressed. So, uh, the international community has to stand firm and together because they have access to vast resources in Iran and they have been using it uh, to feed this monstrosity that states sponsored terrorism all over the world. So um, that's my answer to the question. There are many more questions. Uh, I don't know if we have time for one more. Uh, Mrs. Avadi would like to say something. Go ahead, please. With regard to the issue of the international community and what kind of help it can render to human rights, what I can say is that 
the people in Iran are struggling and trying um, to preserve uh, human rights and we have been trying to do it for a long time, many years. What we expect from the international community is to do something without damaging the people. That's to say, to weaken the government without harming the people. When you have economic sanctions, this creates and has caused poverty for the people. But if you shut down the radio television of Iran, if you sanction the state radio and television, and also subsidiary sanctions are imposed on it, Iranian propaganda will stop all over the world. And even for some of the uh, uh, cities uh, which are not close to Tehran, they will not be able to send their programs. And this is going to be um, something that will seriously affect the, the workings of the government. It has been a number of years that I have been requesting this from the international community. I have been requesting that instead of not letting Iranians come to your countries and to uh, instead of uh, preventing our youth to come to your countries to continue their education or instead of imposing economic sanctions which will cause poverty for the people instead of that shut down the voice of the Iranian government and do not uh, permit the government to have its propaganda if you uh, sanction the state uh, tel, uh, Iran, the, the, Iran, the Iran state uh, radio and television, then there will not be any propaganda by them. And this will be a very big step forward uh, to uh, ma uh, bringing uh, the, the government to uh, account. Uh, and uh, uh, the government of Iran then will not be able to attract to it the extremist uh, elements and to strengthen its, its own extremist elements and also the, the, gov the, the people of uh, Iran who are working and struggling for human rights, they will also be encouraged and they will show that they, their voice is being heard. I am a defender of human rights and I think that we have to go after such sanctions and I would like to encourage uh, such sanctions, sanctions that weaken the government but does not damage the people. And uh, in this uh, connection, I have been uh, asking for a sanction on the Iranian state radio and television so that they cannot uh, they cannot broadcast the confessions of prisoners of belief and political prisoners that they have obtained on the torture. They, they will not be able to do that. They, you, you have to shut down the loudspeakers of the Iranian government. Thank you very much, Ms. Abadi. Um, I think we have time for one last question, and uh, it's, uh, it's a question for Mr. Karaguzlu. Please, can you explain a little more about the recent law changes you mentioned and their likely impact on uh, upon minority groups? Well, the laws that I mentioned, Articles 499 and 500, uh, are part of the greater plan, uh, it seems, by Mr. Khamenei to form an ironclad uh, form of rule where the slightest dissent uh, or even a hint of dissent is dealt with uh, abruptly and violently. Uh, the experiences of the past two years has shown them uh, that they don't have any base uh, of supporting any uh, segment of the society anymore. And uh, these uh, uprisings were increasing daily uh, in number and intensity. So. Uh, this is part of the plan to uh, have uh, IRGC control the country, country, not just the economics, rule the whole country, uh, and any form of dissent uh, would be crushed immediately. Uh, so 
uh, by branding, uh, making it a crime uh, to be part of a sect and branding a group as a sect uh, gives them an open hand to, to uh, 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 crush uh, any form of uh, uprising or dissatisfaction with the government. And uh, <clears throat> what is disturbing is that they also have uh, people within these communities, like, uh, for example, within the Sufi community, they had uh, their agents take over, over the community, which led to uh, the house arrest of Dr. Uh, Tavande and his gradual uh, poisoning, and uh, finally, uh, in less than two years, uh, to murder him. And these four agents have already taken over the control of the Bonabadi Sufis. And if that doesn't work, then they would be labeled as a sect and they would be crushed. The same is true with the uh, Christians, the Baha'is uh, in particular, and uh, even Jewish, I mean, everybody, any, any form of dissent would be labeled as a sect and then it would be punishable by law. Uh, so that's, that's what uh, seems to be Khamenei's final act, to make sure his regime survives, to hand it off to his son, uh, Mushtaba Khamenei. Um, any other questions and comments? I appreciate. Well, I just wanted to thank you for uh, creating this forum. It's very informative, and my hope is that we can basically uh, share these uh, concerns with the international community and uh, make them aware of what is going on in Iran, because it is precisely this awareness in light of what else is going on in the world with the COVID-19 and other uh, important issues, it is important that the violation of human rights be shared with the international community so that Iran, Iranian government does not feel that it can do whatever it wants to do in darkness without the attention of the international community. Thank you. For my uh, turn, I would like to, uh, for my part, I would also like to thank the organizers and I would like to um, say that it's very important that the Iranian people know that their uh, voice uh, reverberates somewhere, is heard somewhere and uh, it is important for us to know um, to work with international media and to reflect the requests and the desire of the people but the world has to know what is happening in Iran and how um, the government uses any opportunity in order to uh, subdue and subjugate people. Uh, uh, the, my last words would be this, that deliberately Deliberately, the Ukrainian airplane was shot down. And all the passengers were killed in one go. And until now, they have resorted to different excuses in order not to present the black box. Why? Because because they don't want anybody to know the facts. They don't want to, anybody to know why it was that it happened, the, the, why they deliberately they shut it down. My request is that the voice of the people should be heard by the people in, of the world. And it, they should know what people have suffered because of this regime. They have been suffering for 40 years and they are still continuing. If I could also just uh, say a few last words regarding um, our advocacy vis-a-vis -vis online um, hate. And the uh, language coming out of this regime is a perfect uh, um, evidence that we at ADL work with all the social media platform companies, Facebook, Twitter, um, Instagram, all of them. Language coming from this regime is exactly the evidence we need to get these social media companies to be more proactive about limiting their language online. 
So we at ADL, through our Center for Technology and Society, will be pushing very hard um, to bear pressure on the social media companies to limit this kind of hate speech. And we think that, uh, as I agree completely with um, Mrs. Ebadi, that we have to do everything we can to limit the ability of this regime to spread its hate internationally. And we also will be using as part of our advocacy the targeting, the specific targeting of um, Iranian media outlets like Press TV um, and like Hispan TV. So we will be advocating not only with the US government, but internationally, uh, the limitation of these uh, outlets for, for hate speech. So uh, thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. If I may have uh, just a few words uh, at the end, uh, I'd like to finish my remarks uh, on, on the message of hope. Uh, first of all, I'm grateful for the, for the opportunity to have um, uh, hear from the panel. Um, one of the questions that were asked in the chat was about the uh, proposed amendments to the Article 499 and 500, and the core of the question is why Iran is uh, proposing such uh, severe uh, laws. And I think um, uh, my my response is authoritarianism. The, this government feels they have lost the monopoly. Uh, they lost the hearts and minds of people, and therefore they uh, impose further controls uh, to ensure their long longevity and uh, survival in power, which means there is fear, there is weakness. And that's the message of hope, that the further uh, we uh, expose these uh, hypocritical uh, attitudes and policies and laws, not just to the elite, but also to general public, to the international community and the people around the world. But uh, it further uh, uh, weakens this, uh, this government to either um, review their uh, attitudes and policies and practices or give rise to uh, people who, or empower people who long to see uh, religious freedom and, and um, right to religious freedom and belief established. Uh, if you allow me, I would also like to say a few words. Uh, thank you for um, having invited me. Uh, I, I, I enjoyed hearing your views. Thank you for that. And uh, it was uh, uh, an opportunity for me to uh, participate for the first time in such a panel. I hope uh, that uh, through compassion, empathy, unity and solidarity we can create an opportunity to um, pass through this this uh, time period and to do away with this regime and uh, to have uh, a transparent and democratic regime so that we, we cannot have we will not have the concerns that we have today Thank you very much. Well, thank you. I would like to express my sincere gratitude and thanks to our uh, guests, IRF and the Iran Working Group. And I hope that this is the first of many more uh, such events to come. Uh, it's an urgent matter that needs to be addressed. Uh, thank you all.